So I'm going to stop talking so much, and I'm going to bring up my little place where you can ask me for money. Um, but here, you guys should feel free to not pay very much attention to me, but I'm going to go through the exercise of, I'm going to create um, a brand new account on this computer. Um, so that I'm roughly in the position that you are. And my hope is that I can carry you through from this point to registering a name, at least, on your own with SBT Ethereum. So let's try that out. Again, you guys can feel free to talk, and you don't have to pay much attention to me, but I will sort of demo things by walking you through it. Okay. Let's make this text bigger. Okay, so this is, oh, I have to go to my new home. So this is a brand new user on my Mac. So this is maybe where you are if you weren't here last time to download this. And so the way that I'm gonna get started, one thing I should have mentioned in the prerequisites, it's very helpful to, it's not necessary, it's very helpful to have Git on your computer. If you don't, you can download the same thing from GitHub, but the starting point, the easiest place to start playing with um, SPT Ethereum is this package called ETH command line. Um, so if you have Git, um, you're just going to clone this. If you don't, you can download it as a zip file from here. But if we go to the getting started thing or this ENS talk page I've made, the first command here makes it kind of obvious. Just can copy that. And I, you need to have a um, JVM on your computer. 8 or 11, the long-term support versions of a JVM will work fine. 12 and 13, I think, won't work fine. I think you'll have problems. Um, so this is the command. Again, you can copy it from this ENS talk page um, if you can find that. Um, and it will get you um, a directory. And then just following the stupid little directions, we CD into that directory. And if you are... Um, on a Mac or Linux machine, there's a bash script that will start up SBT and SBT Ethereum for you right there. It's called SBTW. If you are running Windows, you do need to download the program SBT and install it separately. It, the, the script won't work. But I should just be able to do this. And the first time you do it, it will download a lot of crap. So it will take a few minutes. Um, so, so you have a mm -hmm. question. Um, Eric was asking a kind of slightly related question. Is that, you know, a few years ago when ENS was proposed, I was actually imagining that like exchanges and others would start using ENS for resolving addresses. And uh, I don't know, I just seemed like, uh, I mean, of course, it's. Of course, you know, we're using it here, right? Because we're cool, but... Uh... So a, a fair number of wallets support it, but mostly, in my experience, is the exchanges don't. I think the exchange from an exchange's perspective, their view is basically, like, why do we want to take... 
the risk of there being some controversy about what the address was. Oh, okay. So, so, and so, just to be clear, like, uh, and so, which wallets? Like, um, what's the um, the browser? <coughs> like like MetaMask. MetaMask supports it, I guess. I think so. Um, I'm not sure. I, I rarely use MetaMask. But, um, I mean, if we go to, I'm sure, ENS domain, so the, the home for this stuff is ENS.domains, and um, I suspect that they tout somewhere, some logo wall or whatever. Of, okay, so look, here, these are mobile wallets supporting ENS, desktop wallets, yeah, MetaMask, my third wallet, and then a lot of applications. Oh, okay, right. okay. So great. lots right. of, I mean, ENS... It, it would be nice if the exchange had supported it, but you can understand why they don't, right? Which is okay. The, okay. The, but, Maybe um, that's fine. Maybe yeah. you know we're it's uh, the exchanges are kind of on the, the boundary, and so maybe it's at least yeah. on chain. It looks like the things that are operating on chain are yeah generally supporting it. Yeah, the Ethereum ecosystem is. I mean, there are other competitors for this idea of decentralized naming. You know, ENS is trying to escape the Ethereum ecosystem as a ghetto and be a general purpose decentralized naming solution. That's why they they have this multi-chain support, which SPT Ethereum very recently now supports. Um, but um, so decentralized naming is a thing, and ENS is a significant competitor in the space, and it's dominant within the Ethereum ecosystem for sure um, for decentralized naming. So if you are running SPT Ethereum for the first time, and only if you're running it for the first time, if you've run it before, you won't see this. SPT Ethereum tries to get you started. Um, so it notices that, among other things, SPT Ethereum is uh, an Ethereum wallet application. It's a, it keeps track of um, encrypted private keys and addresses for you and lets you access them. And you can't really do all that much if you don't have an identity. So if it notices that you don't have one set up, it will ask you. So what does it mean you don't have one set up? SBT Ethereum is very stateful. It creates for you somewhere, depending on your machine, it's going to be in home library application support, or it's going to be a dot folder or something. On Windows, it's a conventional place. I forget what it is for application data. Um, it creates a little literal database for you and a key store where you can store private keys. And so just by starting up SBT Ethereum, it's already created that for you, but it notices you don't have any keys set up and it pesters you because what's the use? Ask you, says there no wallets in the SBT Ethereum key store, would you like to generate one? Say yes. Okay, all of a sudden I have an Ethereum address. I'm gonna enter a passphrase for it. Okay, um, it pastures you that it might be a good idea to make sure that you can open the wallet. So um, is that the, uh, where, where you should send funds to? Um, that address there to get started? No, I need to send funds to you. Oh, oh like for me, yeah. No, like if I wanted to populate my new <coughs> wallet here with a little bit of funds from MetaMask, is that what I would send it to? Oh, if, if you have funds on MetaMask, yeah, okay. yeah. If you want to send it to yourself, yeah. I'm offering to send funds to you. But if you have funds on MetaMask, I'm delighted for you to send it to yourself. But yeah, so this is the Ethereum address that is now currently an address set up for you. You've got a wallet and a passphrase. Um, you usually do. You want to have a default sender set up in SBT Ethereum. It's really helpful. So you usually say yes to if you want it to be the default sender. Um, it will also pester you in case you ever want to develop smart contracts. It notices it doesn't have a Solidity compiler. Again, just say yes to everything. Um, and it will very quickly install a Solidity compiler for you. It just installs a binary in its own little private directory. Um, so, yeah. So if I'm doing this in a Docker image, it's going to all go away. So can I get my, uh, is there a command to get my um, mnemonic word? Um, so they're not mnemonic words. So this is not a hierarchical, it doesn't use a hierarchical deterministic. Each one is a key pair. Um, so there is a command to export all of the data and then re-import it. Um, it's better not to do it. <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, that's a, an interesting question because it is really stateful. You, you do need there to be some 
way, I don't know enough about like what you can do with containers, whether or not you can sort of punch that hole. Yeah, you can uh, mount a folder and um, Yeah, so, so you have to that, set that up in advance. Right, that's something worth sort of thinking about um, how to arrange. It's worth doing, I think. I think it's a great idea. Um, but it probably it probably requires a little bit of work on my part to let you specify where you want that to go rather than to go in the default places. Um, uh, once you're here, um, if you do ever want to export all your data, so if you become an SBT Ethereum user, um, that database, that internal database is really, really important, right? All of your encrypted private keys are there. If you ever lose that, Obviously, if you lose your passcodes, you're screwed because um, they're encrypted. Um, but even if you remember your passcodes, if you lose those wallet files, you're screwed. Plus, over time, you generate a database of history, of contracts that you've interacted with. Um, you generate a lot of important data, and it all goes into what's called the, the SBT Ethereum shoebox. So um, base, the most basic thing about SBT Ethereum is that the commands are annoyingly long but it's very tab complete -y. So ETH capital S gives shoebox, and then you can see the things that you can do. Um, and there is backup. So you just do that, and it is very interactive. Um, and I'm gonna say, um, just my home directory is going to be my default backup directory for now, you probably should Pick a better one, um, and not that there's much in it, but right now it is doing a full backup of all of the keys and um, anything that's in the database. Um, we'll see, hopefully, that you do get things in the database over time, um, and we're good to go. Um, so now we are in this Ethereum command line. Our, task for today is to play around with ENS. So if we type ENS and tab. Um, Can we put the, uh, the, the line a little higher up? Maybe move the terminal. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. OK, is that better? Everybody see it? OK, so if you type ENS and tab, again, you'll, you'll hate this software if you don't get comfortable with tab completion, because it's really um, you know, the choice I made was instead of to have a command line with switches that are terse and make it easy for expert users to conveniently type things, I made commands that are very long and descriptive on the theory that if you use tab completion, that's not too horrible. Um, and you can pretty much tell what these commands do just from their names. There aren't switches. If something is so complicated that it would require a switch, the, the task becomes interactive. Um, so I can do something like ENS um, owner lookup, and I can look up, for example, Decenta, yes. Well, hopefully I wasn't missing it when I registered it. <laughs> Let's see about that. Okay, and there it is. So that address is in fact owned. We've done our law. Okay, good job. So the decentralized, we have consensus. We have consensus in, on the Ethereum network. So you're hashing it and then checking whether it's out there? Yeah, so behind the scenes, what had to happen to make this happen? We had to do the name hash, which started with all zeros and then concatenated it with the hash of ETH and then concatenated that with the hash of decentralization foundation to generate the name hash. Um, and then we went to ENS and called the function owner on the ENS object, which is that one magic pi address in the sky. And we got that owner. Um, and then from that, we just called the owner function. It's the easiest one. Um, and we got this address. Now, I don't think that there, oops, what did I just do? Oh, that wasn't too terrible. Um, another thing that I might want to look up, oh, that's not going to be helpful, um, is the address, right? So again, there's a distinction between owner and address. Address is who the money goes to, owner is who gets to change stuff. Um, 
I don't think we've set one up for decentralization foundation. Right? But if you if we look at money grubbing me, we can do the same exercise. And if I say SBT dash Ethereum dot ETH, um, that's the owner. But since I am money grubbing and glad to, glad to accept donations here, there is an address there as well, right? So those are two distinct things, the owner and the address. Um, okay. So that's read-only stuff. The other thing that we can do, why don't we do this while we're still in read-only mode? Because it's all it's a really good exercise. Is there a question? No? Okay. Um, please feel free to, you know, get up, shout, throw things, What's cheer. The for, the for, the, for the managing the wallet? So the wallet is always there. The interesting thing, the way that SPT Ethereum works is that we're running in a session. If you type ETH, you'll get information about your session. Um, so we're active now on chain with ID1, that's Ethereum mainnet, um, and we're interacting with a node, it's an Ethereum node, that's just a node that I maintain. The important thing to notice is that there's a current session sender, um, and that's the only address, since this was fresh, we've only generated one address, and that's a current sender and it has an alias. Um, called default sender. So um, if I wanted to, I could try to do something like ETH transaction, ether send, um, and I could, for if I hit tab, it will tell me what I need to press next, and that's a recipient address. And I could, to send money to myself, paste this whole thing in, but SBT Ethereum wants you to give aliases to all the addresses you interact with. I can just use default center, sender, right? So SPT Ethereum, the database maintains a mapping of names that you give to addresses and addresses, a kind of your own private, not decentralized ENS um, for just the names that you like to use. Um, and default sender is the is a automatic name for whoever your default session sender is. Or for, I'm sorry, it's not your default session sender. It's, it's for the, the sender you defined as a default when you set it up and started it up. Um, so the wallet, there's lots of stuff. There's ETH key store are the things that are sort of most directly wallet management commands. Um, so we can do ETH key store list and see the addresses that are there. We can import from JSON wallet files. Um, we, SPT Ethereum uses the standard V3 JSON wallets that are common in Ethereum land. We can import from private keys. Um, if we really want to, we can reveal private keys. Um, so this is the stuff that's basically managing your wallet. You can have as many addresses as you want. Um, you can create as many wallets as you want. All of this um, ETH key store. Um, wallet v3 create, make a new wallet v3. Um, the reason why there's wallet v3 and not just the key store create is because eventually I hope to support things like HD wallets and other wallet formats. So it's hierarchical in that way. Um, so generally speaking, here we just have one address, but I can make another one. ETH key store wallet v3 create. Um, so make another one. Okay, let's see if I manage to do that. Okay, so now I have a new address. Almost always when SBT Ethereum creates or encounters a new address, it gives you an opportunity to give it an alias. Um, so I'm gonna just call this secondary address. So I'm gonna give it an alias and call it secondary address for now. It's not that interesting a name, but I'm not that creative a person. Um, and so now if I do something like ETH transaction, ETH or send, and I hit tab, 
I have secondary address as an address that it knows about. Um, I can give aliases to any address. So if somebody has gotten far enough to like request money up here, anybody done that in the give me money issue? No. Well, um, whenever somebody here, I'll I'll do it. I'll be it myself. So I'm gonna bring up another eth command line as me. This is my usual very overburdened. Um, so you're trying to get a balance of it? From, so it's, it's ETH address balance. So it's ETH and then capital A for address. Again, these long hierarchical commands, whether that's a good idea or not, it's a choice I made. If you do eth address balance and just hit return, you'll get the balance from your default sender. Um, if you specify another address, you'll get it for another sender, eth address balance. So there's a whole lot of eth address commands for interacting with things. The main things to think about, SPT Ethereum has a notion of the current sender. So you've set up a default sender, but you can always override it for the session. So you can be whoever you want. Um, so I can, if I want to say ETH address sender, oops, sender override to the secondary address that I've just created. And now if I type ETH to look at my environment, um, my current session sender is now a secondary address. right? And then if I drop that override, I'll go back to primary. So in a session, you're always somebody. You always have an identity. Um, Right, having dropped the override, I'm now my default sender again. You always have an identity. You manage that with these eth address commands. The eth address alias stuff is really important. A lot of why, you know, I think SBT Ethereum, if you play with it, it really is kind of a power tool for interacting with Ethereum. And a lot of why is because you can interact with things really fast because you're not constantly hunting around to cut and paste and interact with contract addresses because you give them aliases. So if I cheat a little bit, and I do eth address alias check ENS. Um, so this is this is now I'm going to bring it up in case people can't see it down there. This is this is my real world. This is where I live. Um, so my own environment, my own shoebox, as opposed to this other one, was I was playing around with you guys with as a fresh user. So I can do eth address alias check ENS because I know that I have it already. So this is that gateway ENS. For one thing, I'm going to put it here in this. Oh, you could send a tiny amount to christianpeel.eth, everybody. Um, um, I'm going to put this address in here so that everybody has it. Um, and then I'm going to do what you should do if you have something that you want to play with. So now I'm back in my... Um, not very populated, this very fresh SBT Ethereum, and I'm going to do ETH address alias that. I'm going to type ENS and that address, um, and I am good to go. Um, now if I want to interact with that, don't send Ether to ENS, but you could, I can just refer to that address as ENS and I can tab complete my way through it. Um, if I want to interact by hand with that ENS contract, we saw what that ENS contract looks like. There should be some way to do it. What do I need to do though before I can interact with an Ethereum contract? Anybody know what I'm missing besides the address? You really need two things before you can conveniently interact with a smart contract. It's address and ABI, ABI right. Um, so I'm going to do ETH contract ABI import, and then I can do ENS, so I'm importing for that address, but I can refer to it just as ENS. Now I have to find the ABI. Now, if I had set an Etherscan API key, so SBT Ethereum will let you set an Etherscan API key, and then if it's an Etherscan verified address, it will automatically download it. But in this fresh instance, I don't have that. 
So I'm just going to go to that address on Etherscan and I'm going to copy this ABI and then I'm going to paste it in. Okay, and now I have ENS and now I have sort of the kind of amazing thing about ENS, I, about SPT Ethereum, I think, is that all of a sudden I can interact with ENS directly. Right, so this is the contract. These are the read-only methods of the contract because I use ETH transaction view. If I wanted to see the read-write methods of the ENS contract, I would use ETH transaction invoke. It's really important not to confuse those two things. View is just a private lookup at my own node. I'm just reading the state of the blockchain. Invoke means submitting a transaction to the Ethereum network to change the state of the blockchain. Um, so if, I, if we want to now, I can look up, what name did we look up before? We looked up um, something like, let's look up um, christianpeel.eth since he's, um, so we had ENS, he says there's an address, look up at christianpeel.eth. Um, we do have an address there now that we can send money to. Um, if we look up the name hash, name hashes for christianpeel.eth, SPT Ethereum will tell us the hash if we want. And then we can also do ETH transaction. Um, oh, to make this easier, th that was an address. I want to look up the owner because that's a, the easier one to look up. It's a two-step thing to look up the address. We'll do that too, but it's a... It, it's a little bit cumbersome. So here's the owner of christianpeel.eth just doing a lookup with the tooling. If we want to do it directly with the contract, we can do ETH transaction view. ENS was the contract, the owner function, and then we needed the um, name hash of christianpeel.eth is this. right? So if I hit tab again, it should be asking me for Node of bytes 32, there's a byte 32. And there we go, we got the owner, which should match what we looked up. Let's do it again with ENS owner lookup. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so those are the same address, right? So we just did it both ways. We used the tooling in SBT Ethereum and we use the manual interaction with the smart contract. I'm curious in the ABI, is there some, uh, uh, is, it, is there some way that it's confirmed? I mean, is there like a ha hash of the ABI that is somehow checked with the blockchain to make certain you have it right? Or how do you so, no, so the, the way that you verify an ABI and this is, uh, you know, right now, the Ethereum community in a very centralized way basically relies on Etherscan to do this. But for now, the way that you verify an ABI is you recompile the contract. You take the source code of the contract, you compile the source code, and make sure you get the same bytecode and the same artifacts, right? So when you, if you want to verify a smart contract, um, on Etherscan, you have to supply all the information about your compiler, you have to supply, um, and you supply the, the source code, and then it will rerun the compiler, guarantee that they match exactly, and only then will it declare the contract verified. So if you trust Etherscan, you can download from Etherscan. If you don't, then either you're trusting someone who's giving you the ABI, um, Okay, so, uh, all right, very good. We're baby steps, I guess, is what we're after here. Well, I mean, I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, right, I'm mostly emphasizing, like, what you can do and how, but really it's, it's not even the ABI per se. It's what, what does that smart contract do, right? So I can have a perfectly innocuous function, innocuous function that's like set address or something, um, and instead it, you know, does something else, right? You need the source code um, to see that. Now, for the most part, there's a little bit of protection in Ethereum land in that, it, you know, you, you, you won't actually, it, it's, not, it's not as dangerous as it sounds, but usually when you interact with a smart contract, you want to know what it does, and you need to, to know what it does, you either need to trust someone who's telling you what it does, or you need to look at the source code. Um, but on Etherscan, they do every verified contract, every contract whose source code is published, has gone through 
this process of they literally recompile it. They keep all of the compilers that have ever been. They recompile the code and they verify it. Um, anytime that you compile and deploy a smart contract on SBT Ethereum, that's a little bit out of scope for our project today. I want to get you guys to register a name, but I don't think we're going to uh, develop and deploy smart contracts, but you can very easily, and I'm glad to show anybody who's interested anytime they want. Um, anytime you do that, um, SBT Ethereum saves all of the information about your deployment, about your compilation and deployment. So Fortune is just an alias for a contract that I have deployed. And if I press this, it's going to give me all kinds of crap. That's everything you might want to know. The original source code exactly as it got compiled, the bytecode that got developed, um, this is the transaction hash and the deployer address because this was deployed. It's not just a compilation, it's a deployment, the current contract address. But the important stuff is this stuff down here below the code, the constructor inputs, the contract name, the contract source code, the language, the language version, the compiler version precisely, the compiler options, whether an optimizer was used, um, are all retained. And the reason that they're always retained is you can hand this information to anyone and they can exactly validate. They can, the, the code that's on the blockchain is public and they can reproduce that code by compiling your source code. And that's what Etherscan does. So if you want to verify a contract that you've compiled and deployed on Etherscan, you just cut these things out of here. You cut the source code and publish it into the source. You cut, you know, you know the, you know the Solidity version, you know the compiler version, and you tell it that you were running it with the optimizer, in this case, disabled. Um, if it's enabled, then how many runs it runs. Like those are all things that you tell um, Etherscan when you want to verify a contract and SPT Ethereum always retains all of it so that you always have it. Um, so, okay. Um, uh, so we have done now, in terms of this exercise, we have looked up some stuff by ENS um, using SPT's built-in ENS library. Um, and we have also looked up some stuff using um, ETH transaction view, which is a read-only directly from ENS. We did this um, to look up the hash. The next step is this is reading stuff. Can we register? Can we do something that affects the blockchain? So in order to do that, if you guys are following along, you'll need to give me an address. Um, so I can send some to Chris um, at christianpeel.eth but if you guys have followed along if you can paste in an address to here I'll send you some ETH so that you can if we try to for example let's just try this now if I just do ENS name register and I need to pick a name um, Okay, I'm gonna register for it. Register it for a month. So exciting! Um, tells me how much it's gonna cost. Um, okay, this is tricky, right? So as we said with registration, to register, you need two transactions. There's a commitment transaction, and then there's a register transaction. Two transactions means fragile. Right? Something, the first transaction could succeed and the second transaction might not. Um, so it asks you, do you understand? Because it really wants you to take note of this piece here, where if you want to pick up where you left off, right, this includes both the name hash and the secret that it generated for you. If you want to pick up where you left off, if you don't want to do a new commitment, but use a commitment that you've already used, you can copy and paste this whole long command. So that's basically what normally SPT Ethereum tries to do the registration process all at once for you. It will submit a transaction, wait the required period, and then submit the second transaction. But if something goes wrong, 
and support to have that. But right now, okay, I'm going to say, okay, let's do the commitment transaction. Is this going to work? So the answer is no, it's not going to work. Oh, I have to. Um, it's not going to work. Why isn't it going to work? Because I don't have any funds, right? So this is my fresh window that I just made, a fresh user. I can create an Ethereum address all I want. But if I want to submit transactions, if I want to change the Ethereum blockchain, then I need to send this address a little bit of money. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I have my own address. And then again, I encourage you guys to, if you send me an address, I will send you a little bit of Ether. Um, I'll do that to you in a second, Chris. So let's see, we have uh, my address here is this guy. And I'm going to send myself a little bit of Ether send to this address and I'm going to send 0 0.005 ether to myself okay I forgot I really want to get in the habit when I do demos of um, upgrading my gas because I don't know how much gas did I pay 1.1 way so SPT Ethereum tries to automatically guess oh that was all right tries to automatically guess a decent gas price by looking at the there's a service on Ethereum nodes that's about guessing a default gas price but if you want your transaction to happen fast then you want to give it more gas. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But so anyway, so I sent 0 0.005 ether to my address here. Now if I do eth address balance all of a sudden I have 0 0.005 eth which corresponds to about 95 cents. Now I should be able to do the ENS register. I think a different address though. Yeah. Following along. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you've used that one with the weird letters. Yeah, I, I might have. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, normally I try to like you can do like ens, ens name, status, and then try to come up with some like, um, I I I don't know, um, crazy elephant. Dot eth. Right, so that one, if I look it up, it's currently available. So I'm going to do, um, because I'm a little bit concerned about I don't want things to take too much time, I'm going to show you how you give more than the default amount of gas. So I'm going to do ETH transaction gas price override. And it's interactive. I can specify exactly what I want to override it to, but I'm not going to do that. I am going to give it a markup, 50% markup over the default. Um, and I'm not going to do a cap or a floor. I could do that too. And now I'm going to do ENS um, name register. And it was, what was it? Crazyelephant.eth that I was looking at? Uh, Crazyelephant.eth. And I'm going to register for a month. OK. Um, that's going to cost me about 44 cents. Um, I will say yes to that. OK. It tells me what it's going to do about the two transactions. Um, and that if I need to continue where I left off, if one fails, this is the command I need to copy and paste. I say I understand. I say OK. Let's do it. This is the commitment transaction. So since I had just unlocked my wallet, I didn't have to type my passcode again. I could just say why. Um, by default, I think it keeps wallets unlocked for five minutes. It's a configuration parameter you can set. Yeah? Do you go to uh, my Ether wallet to set up the wallet? I'm trying to do it right now. No, no. So this is its own wallet. Oh, it's its own wallet. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So when I went to register it for a month, 
fifteen bucks. So I mean, is that how is that? Yeah. So there's the for a long time the minimum registerable registerable address on ENS was like it had to be at least either six or seven characters. I don't remember which. And now they've made short names available, but there's supposed to be like an auction process or something. So I guess if you circumvent the auction process and just try to register, it will give you a high price. I've never seen that, but um, oh, I have to price Y here. <laughs> um, there we go. Um, that was dumb of me. Um, and so now a transaction submitted. Hopefully it won't take too long to mine since I gave it extra gas. You can always just, to prove to yourself while it's doing stuff like this, you can look at it on Etherscan and make sure that things are happening the way you expect that they should be. How are you generating the private key? Well, so you set up a password, right? So I'm doing this, oh, this is already mine, apparently. Um, set up a passphrase. Um, and then normally it would have asked me here for the passphrase. But because a minute before I had um, done something that required the passphrase, I had, oh, I had, I had done this command while, without having any ether. I had run it and I had entered the passphrase. So SBT Ethereum keeps wallets unlocked for like five minutes by default. But, I mean, originally, how did you get the private key from the password? Well, so when you set up the wallet, right, that thing that you did at the very beginning, it generated a private key for you, generated an address for you, saved the private key in a JSON file encrypted by that passphrase. Okay, but okay. how did it generate the private key? It generated the private key using the randomness from Java Security Secure Random. So if you want better randomness, that's something that I'm thinking a lot about in terms of which the default be. If you want better randomness in Java Security Secure Random, you can, it's configurable, you can, you can define your own um, random number generator if you want. Um, and if there's a stronger default, if you have ideas for a stronger default, I'd like to think about it. <laughs> um, Okay, so now this is, we waited the required 60 seconds, and now it's asking us if we want to do the second transaction. If we're cool with it, we're cool with it. Oh, yes. Thank you. It's not so great when it is right there. Um, it confuses me. I'm the asshole who wrote it. <laughs> Okay. So if anybody else wants to try this, has anybody sent me a request for money? Chris has, so I will do that, but let's see. So this, okay, so this is mine, and crazyelephant.eth belongs to this address, and the registration is valid until a month from now. Yes, this create the element that eats as uh, the spire on the 11th of December. Um, yeah, I, I just did a month. Okay, I just saying I found it here, you know, my client agreed with Oh, yeah. Somehow. That is remarkable. That is amazing. Um, so, um, anyway, so from here, um, depending on what people are interested in, so far, uh, how, who has managed to get any of this to work, to follow along? So Eric, I know Chris kind of has, Jeff has, but you guys have seen it before. Is there, is there anyone who's trying who I can help out? <laughs>